cutting board 101 and 102. So this video is going to walk you through all the steps and how to make a cutting board, uh, both for beginners and for experts who've made quite a few. Uh, myself, I've made hundreds of cutting boards, lots of different styles. A couple years ago, I made this video, this cutting board 101 video, and I went through and I did the big overview, and it was really helpful for a lot of folks. Uh, there were a couple questions that people had that I wanted to introduce in a new cutting board 101 video, also things I've learned uh, in experimentation over the last two years, but also some advanced steps just to make more refined, uh, higher quality boards. So it's a comprehensive video. That's how we roll here, tutorial style. And so in this video, we're primarily focusing on butcher block edge grain boards. Uh, so these big, you know, thicker ones, you got inset handles, we have juice groove, and it's edge grain. So what that means is you take a piece of wood, right? So I got, you know, this big serving board, and this is a, a piece of wood, and I cut it into strips, and I flip it on its edge, and then you glue it together. It's just stronger. Uh, you can get more intricate patterns, really great results. I will briefly talk about face grain boards, where you just take boards and you just glue them next to each other. They still work great. Sometimes they show a little bit more knife marks. Um, and I do have other videos on end grain boards, uh, where you take the wood, and then you flip it on its end. And you can get some really crazy patterns. You can even do inlay. Uh, this is CNC, don't worry. There's no CNCs in this video. Uh, anyway, minimal tools. You don't need lots of fancy tools. So I will say that yes, I have more tools now than I used to. However, I've made all these boards with, with really humble basic tools before. You can watch some old videos to see that. So don't be discouraged or think you need a shop full of tools uh, to pull this off. So lots of tips and tricks. Use the timestamps down below if you're looking for something in particular, uh, but lots going on here. So here you have it, cutting board 101 and cutting board 102. Let's make some cutting boards. All right, so you can see here, I got a little collection of wood, um, all sorts of different hardwoods. So there's a lot of considerations uh, that you need to take into account when making a cutting board, and here are some of those considerations. All right, before we get too far into this, wood selection is key. So you saw all those different ones that I used with this batch that you'll see throughout, but I just wanna note a couple of them. One that I love in particular, cherry, walnut, and maple. So three, those three, at least here in North America, they're really plentiful, they're, they're easy to find, and they're just such a great color, the contrast is fantastic. Um, domestic hardwoods, at least here in North America, you can also find this in other countries as well, uh, they work really well. You can get into some exotics, right, like Purple Heart, Wenge, Yellow Heart, Paduke, all those colors. You just want to research them and understand how they work. Sometimes they have a higher oil content, there's some uh, other considerations to take into account. I have a whole other video that talks in great length about wood, uh, it's called Wood 101, uh, so you can check that video after this and, and learn a little bit more, as well as where to find wood, where to buy it, where to get these really cool exotics and whatnot. But something to consider when you're buying the wood, when you're getting the wood, before we jump into all these steps, you can buy wood that's already surfaced like this. So you can go to a, a lumber yard, you can go to a woodworking store, and like here, you can see the sticker. This was from Rockler, some curly figured maple. It's already surfaced, so I don't have to run this through a jointer uh, or a planer to get it flat first. However, if I'm buying wood from you know a local sawyer, uh, a local sawmill, it might be uneven and in this situation I would have to run it through a jointer or a CNC to flatten it or make a router sled uh, so you'd have to do that step first. What I'm about to show all of these these boards that I'm going to cut up and go they're pretty much already surfaced so there is that first step that you might want to consider first but anyway wood make a choice watch that video later but let's jump into making these cutting boards. So my first step is cutting my boards to length. Uh, now, if you haven't surfaced them already, if it didn't come pre-surfaced like we showed, if it was rough sawn, you will probably need to use a router sled or a jointer or something like that. But all this stock is pretty much surfaced and I'm cutting it to length. I like my boards to be about 12 inches by 18 inches. And then I usually make them about one and a half inches thick. But if I'm gonna make an 18 inch board, I usually cut them a little bit longer, like 20 to 22 inches. That accounts for snipe, uh, which we'll get into a little bit later. Now here I am using this little bench top jointer. You don't need a jointer. This just saves some time later when I'm cutting things at the table saw, just to make sure I have nice 
uh, you know, glue ups if I'm doing a face grain board. For an edge grain board, it's not as important. Uh, it just helps minimize waste. Uh, but you can also make one of these sleds. These are some uh, match fit clamps. Links down below if you wanna make something like this. Just a really simple sled. You can see my old table saw. I use this a lot. Uh, it's a straight line jig. Lots of things you can do with that. That just helps get the edges jointed. Once you have an edge that's pretty straight, then you can just run it through your table saw. So here, I'm running all of these at one and a half inches wide. So I'm making edge grain boards. So all of these pieces I cut at one and a half inches thick. So then I take the board and then I just roll it over. I rotate it 90 degrees and you can see that's the edge. That's gonna be the top face. That's just better for knife marks. It holds up better. And so I took the face of the board like that. I cut it and then when I do the glue ups, I'll rotate it and that face, uh, that side, the edge will be actually facing up. So all of these pieces here were cut at one and a half inches uh, for my eventual glue ups. Now sometimes I go ahead and make the patterns right away, sometimes I wait. So here I am, I cut all of them to some different sizes, just kind of getting a feel for the patterns I have. I like to do symmetrical patterns, but I also will do some asymmetrical ones as well. Well now I'm adding some thinner pieces. So the thin pieces really add a lot to the pattern. Uh, they add a lot of contrast and I really recommend using those, some really cool patterns. You can of course do this on a bandsaw, that's gonna save you a lot of material. However, if you don't have a bandsaw, you could certainly do this at the table saw. So here are all those little thin rips, those thin pieces. Again, they're still one and a half inches thick. It just adds really cool patterns. And so having those thin pieces does add a lot to the look. However, there are some considerations that you're gonna have to take into account the thinner you go, and you are kind of limited based on your tool setup. So you can still do this with minimal tools, uh, just especially when you're cutting those thin ones, you wanna be safe. Uh, you can see I brought out the tape measure here. Again, I'm going for about a 12 inch by 18 inch board. So I'm making the pattern and just ensuring I have enough width. Here's just really quick, wanna show some face grain boards if you wanna do those. So here, I'm not cutting it the one and a half inches and turning it on its side. These are all about one inch thick uh, pieces and so they're wider panels. And so this is a face grain glue up where I'm not gonna rotate the piece at all. I'm just cutting a ton of different pieces to different widths. These make really cool boards. I'm just You have to take into account, you don't wanna rotate between face grain and edge grain and go back and forth. That just helps to account with wood movement. But you get some pretty cool boards like this. I do enjoy making these face grain boards, especially when you have figured woods, like that curly maple uh, that I showed earlier, or the quilted maple. All right, jumping ahead a little bit here. So once you've milled up your wood, you got all your pieces, your various thickness, inevitably, some of your pieces might have some saw marks. So even if you have a super powered saw, even if you have the best blade, this can happen, right? So you get burn marks, you get uneven stuff, you know, on these thinner ones, you can really see that. And this is a problem because then the wood, if I just took the pieces and put them together like this, I'm not gonna get a good glue up, right? I'm gonna have glue lines, it's gonna, I'm gonna have gaps, and that's where bacteria can be trapped and grow, so that's not good for a board. It's also potentially you're gonna get moisture in there, uh, the board could split and crack, so that's no bueno. So when you're making your boards, You've cut your pieces to size. Um, so you have the option of just cutting, you know, a bunch of pieces, like, you know, about three eighths of an inch, a bunch of quarter inch pieces, a bunch of thick pieces, get them all made, and then you need to surface all of them. You need to surface all your sides. Or you can do what I did and you can't wait, and you just go ahead and you make your patterns. Oh, I love this pattern, but then I have to go through and serve, uh, surface each side. So it's definitely more efficient to go ahead, get all your pieces, all your different thicknesses, I get all my thick ones, all right, that size. Then I get all my kind of next size, next size. Just your different various width, widths to get these patterns, but you wanna surface them. So surfacing bigger pieces like this, uh, there's ways to do it, right? You could use a sander, but it's not gonna be as even. So there's a couple tools that you can use uh, to surface the thick ones all the way down to thinner, to thinner, to super thin. So let's check out those options. First up is one of the most affordable options. This is something I've been wanting to try for a long time, 
Uh, what it is, is you got a table saw, which you obviously need for this project, and you just add one of these discs. So there's no teeth on it, and then you add that Velcro pad, and then you can add different grits of sandpaper, and you've got yourself a disc sander. But what's great about this, it's at the table saw, so you can use your fence. So you just have to be careful with this, and you just kind of sneak it over, and you line it up, and you run it right through like it's a piece of wood. And then instead of cutting it, uh, that sandpaper is cleaning up the edges, and you get perfect. Uh, perfect you know sand you know 90 degrees perpendicular all that kind of stuff and there's no snipe uh, so there's not digging into the end of a board like that can happen on a planer or even a drum sander so this is a great option as a fun little tool uh, link down below if you want to use it it also doubles as a disc sander so if you want to do some stuff here you know dust collection isn't as great but it's a fun little uh, addition that might help you uh, if you're running into some issues so surfacing the sides, you can use the table saw with that disc. You can also use the planer. The planer is not a must have to make cutting boards, but it sure will make your life a lot easier. You don't need all the fancy tools, but a planer really make, will make quicker work of it. Uh, if you have a planer, I can send pieces through, right? This is about three eighths of an inch, half an inch. I can go down to a quarter inch. Uh, there's settings on, on all planers, lunchbox style planers, where I can go thinner, but there gets to a point where I can't go thin enough, right? Like this one, this is like an eighth of an inch, maybe even less. Um, that can't go through a planer. For that, you're gonna need a drum sander. Now that is a pretty expensive tool. Um, so maybe you're limited on the super thin uh, pieces for thin patterns, uh, but there's maker spaces out there. Maybe you can find one where you can utilize it. Um, maybe a, a local college, community college, maybe as a maker space uh, to use a drum sander before you have one. So those are two other options for surfacing the sides. Again, if you have these gouges, you're just gonna have a, a glue up that fails. So you wanna use those tools or you could, or you could do something super sketch okay not super sketch but using a bench vise and inverting your sander i've actually used this a lot with orbital sanders with a bench excuse me with a belt sander this thing is super powerful and so you really need to mind your fingers and if i took a piece like this and i wanted to run it here my fingers are going to be gone so uh plan on if you're going to do this method you really got to make those thin ones Get some gloves that you're okay with losing the tips, maybe some extra pairs, uh, just to run it through, run it through. Now doing it this way is not gonna be perfectly even, so um, you might remove the burn marks, but then you take off too much material on this side and this. So there's lots of other ways. That's the great thing about woodworking. You know, I've, I've built up, I have some more tools over time, but there are some other workarounds. Uh, you can use a, a bench top belt sander along that, uh, but if you're just really determined for those thinner rips, that's another option. Um, more options. All right, take it or leave it. And my favorite option is the drum sander. It just works really well, especially on figured woods. It's not gonna do any kind of tear out. That's my son right there. Uh, one of my three boys who just loves to help. But anyway, especially on those thin pieces, this just is a great way to do it safely. And it's the safest way I found to uh, get good glue ups and to clean up those really, really thin pieces. So you might be limited on how thin you can go. You know, one eighth of an inch might not be in the cards for you if you're not using a drum sander, but you can still get amazing results uh, but here's what it looks like with the drum sander just to give you an idea it is not necessary for these cutting boards but if you want to find someone who has a drum sander find a local maker space you know community colleges are usually a good source for that I could just add some thinner strips and get some good results and of course you could just go back to the jointer clean up the edge and then run it through the planer like that you don't have to have the jointer you could do it all on the planer Again, you do not need a planer. It's just gonna make your life so much better. So uh, it's gonna make your life easier. So of all the tools to add, if you don't have it, the planer would be the best. All right, glue ups. So here's one of those face grain glue ups I talked about earlier. Um, I'm adding my glue. So I use Tight Bond 3. It is a water uh, resistant, a waterproof glue. It's just great because these boards are gonna come in contact with water, right, when it gets washed. So it's my favorite glue to, to use with this. I go heavy on the glue. I would rather waste some glue uh, and ensure it squeezes out and I have it everywhere where I need to, uh, then run short and have little gaps. Uh, so here again, my son loves to help. It's pretty fun to do it with your kids, uh, grandkids, so definitely recommend 
teaching them early, get them started. This little dude right here is not so little anymore. He's done quite a few boards. So uh, we spray it, spread it with our fingers. You can use a brush. You can use a roller if all your pieces are about the same you know, width, but we do so many variations, we just use our finger. Clamping is, is obviously really important. You wanna get a good squeeze out. You don't need to over tighten, uh, but here I just have some four by four blocks. I threw some sheathing tape on the top just so the glue doesn't stick. And then we take our pieces and we run them through. All kinds of different clamps. Um, you know, honestly, pipe clamps are great. There's, there's right there, you see I'm using the hammer to get everything kind of flat. Sometimes it pops up. One other option you can add if you're having issues are what are called calls. Uh, C-A-U-L-S, you can look those up. But calls, just to assure the alignment is perfect, um, so you don't have to do as much flattening. So here's some boards after they've been glued up. Get all these glue dots afterwards. That's how I like to do it, and then I can just scrape off those dots after the fact. What I mean is I don't like to wipe off the glue ahead of time. Some people do. I just prefer this way. I let the board sit for about eight hours to 12 hours, overnight usually, and then I can just scrape them off the next day. All right, so flattening. At this point, a planer is your best friend. Now, if it's relatively flat, you can just run it through the planer. Uh, what I do is I usually run it through a couple times on one side, and then I kind of do skip planing, and I rotate the board back and forth to try and get it as dead flat as possible. Obviously, if you had a 12 inch wide jointer, you could do that. You could also flatten your boards with a, you know, a drum sander. You could use a CNC, you could use a, a router sled and uh, use a router with a, a big bit, but the planer really is the best method. And so we're just running it through here. We're checking to make sure uh, we got it nice and flat. And then we check, oh wait, it's super wobbly. Well, that's actually, this is a week after I surfaced all those boards. So what you're gonna wanna do if you have the time, is after you surface the boards, let them sit for a bit. Because of wood movement, uh, they might warp a little bit. There might be some twisting because that wood's going in all the directions. So what I'm doing here is I'm just showing one way to build like a little sled to run through the planer. You could use pocket holes like I did there, or you can add just a, a, some screws and a piece of scrap wood here so the board doesn't pop out on you. So I take my board and it's got some twist to it, right? And I'll add a shim. So I put it on the board, add a shim in just to make sure it has no rock. And then once I got that, I'm gonna add some hot melt glue, some hot glue, or uh, instead of that, you could use some CA glue and activator. I'll use CA glue a lot to fill voids uh, later in the video. Uh, like that, it's pretty stationary, but then it's not moving at all. So it's flat, there's no rocking. Um, I do like to mark mine with chalk just so I know how much it's been, how much has been removed. And then I'm just sending some gentle passes through the planer. So I'm just sending it through back and forth. And then you can see it's gonna take off the high spots. So here it took off some of the high spots. Another thing you can do with the sled is you can add scrap pieces on the end and make it longer. Uh, so the uh, snipe goes into sacrificial pieces as opposed to your actual board. Uh, here's an example of when I've done that before, milling up stock. Um, so you can actually use your planer as a jointer and you just run it through and you know it the, the snipe at the end where the, the planer blades kind of dip into the wood, it happens on the sacrificial boards. You can get some good results. So that is something you could do. I didn't mess with it here. I just went with the board and then I just sanded out the, what snipe I had. But here I did it, I got a little bit more rock. So you do wanna run it you know, until there's no chalk marks. Then you pull it off, right? Okay, some hot melt, some glue there. Uh, table saw is a great flat surface. So that side is dead flat. There is no rock to it. Now I can flip it over and send it through the planer. So you're, you're using the sled so you at least have one jointed, perfectly flat face, and then I can flip it and run it through the planer. So again, if you're, if you're tight on time, obviously you might not have this option, but really it is a great step, and this is a question a lot of people had uh, in my last Cutting Board 101 videos, like, hey, I had some rock to my board, and. It, so you wanna let it sit. Let it sit for a couple days and just see how the wood moves and then you can flatten it. You just get better results. Okay, now I'm just squaring off my board. So the reverse miter gauge is a great trick. You could use a sled here at the table saw uh, to cut it out, uh, but you wanna square off your ends and then you have the option of adding a juice groove. So here I'm using a round nose bit. Uh, it's a 3 8 inch radius, or you can find a 3 quarter inch round nose bit. And so I've just made this little jig right here. 
Um, I'm using some pocket hole scrap wood on the side. I'm using a plunge router. You could use any kind of router. You could use a trim router, all kinds of different options here. But the big idea here is I'm just screwing it in so it's nice and tight. There are adjustable jigs online. Find a video on a juice groove jig. Um, some pretty cool ones out there. But you have it and it's gonna be offset for where you want it to ride along the board. Tricks with uh, juice grooves is you wanna do incremental depth. So just do a little bit at a time. Don't slow down, don't stop in corners. Just keep it moving, uh, otherwise you're gonna get big burn marks. This is definitely the, the clinching point uh, where you just don't wanna screw it up. So just take your time, do some tests first, but you can get some great results on juice grooves if you choose to use them. And you certainly can go without a juice groove. However, I have found that you know customers, family, they love it. I love using it for barbecue boards. It really adds a lot to it. And so you can definitely do this with, with a router. It doesn't have to be a plunge router. Just take your time and again, like I said, practice and you can get some great results. You also could find a friend with a CNC machine uh, if you wanted to do it that way. All right, next up I wanna talk about handles. So uh, here is a cove bit. Uh, this one is a quarter inch shank, uh, which I'll show in a bit. You could also do the bigger, beefier, uh, that's a cove bit as well, or you can do a chamfer bit. And what I'm doing here at a router table is I'm just doing some handholds. So I did mark it off and I'm kind of freehanding it here and I'm doing that incremental depth again. I don't wanna do a whole bite right away or it's gonna grab the wood and it's gonna chuck it everywhere. Or it's gonna grab my fingers or something like that. So I'm just going nice and easy. An easier way is just to use the router table with a fence and these little stop blocks and that can control uh, how far you go and you can get a lot better results. Again, anytime you're using a router, you wanna just make sure you keep moving, you don't go slow, otherwise you get burn marks. I do have a separate older video that talks all about different handles and handholds, uh, but wanted to briefly show it here. Another one using those you know, clamps, those screw clamps on the fence, I'm adding a you know unique groove on the inside. So it's not gonna show up on either side. So I could flip the board back and forth and you couldn't tell. Uh, this one right here, again, is that round nose bit and it's just going in it. It's pretty slick. It's pretty slick there. A little bit trickier and usually you can get some burn marks. Easiest, easiest. Uh, hand groove is just to cut a chamfer, a really big chamfer at the table saw. So I'm just doing a big bevel, a 45 degree bevel. Uh, I cut either side and then I just kind of sneak up on the line and I got this really heavy chamfer, this 45 degree bevel where when it's sitting down, your fingers can go underneath. It can sit really nicely. That's the easiest and the fastest way to get some handholds. Okay, big tip here. This is a juice groove scraper. So we're doing three quarter inch uh, juice grooves. Well, sometimes you mess up your juice groove or sometimes you get burn marks. So instead of sanding, you can use this scraper and the burr on the edge is able to cut it away. This is gonna save you a ton of time, especially if you messed up a juice groove or if you had some burn marks from a, a dull router bit or you went too slow. Uh, some woods like cherry and ash uh, sometimes they'll burn a little bit easier. So something to consider, a great little tip. And another tip is a flip top carp like this. So this cart uh, I made a while back, I have a whole video on this. There's lots of flip cart, uh, flip top carts out there, but it's great to have multiple tools in one space uh, working out of a garage like this. This bench top sander is really helpful, really handy. This is a Home Depot special. There's lots of other ones out there, but you can really quickly clean up those edges, uh, especially the end grain. It'll save you a little bit of time efficiency. Not necessary, but it comes in handy. Okay, so sanding. I always start with 80 grit sanding. Yes, I have a drum sander, uh, but there's so many sanding lines, I still use the random orbital sander. And I'm going 80 grit and I'm cleaning up all the side. Uh, like you can see here, I did have some voids, so sometimes there's little bug holes or cracks, and you can fill that with uh, epoxy or CA glue and activator. It goes a lot quicker. So I sand the, the top and the bottom and all the edges first at 80 grit. I'm not touching the edges at all because I still need to do some router profiles on that, but this just ensures I have good clean edges uh, for the router work later. Okay, branding. 
really quick, I wanna talk about some options for branding. So if you're just a maker as a hobbyist, uh, brand your work's fun. Uh, if you're selling things, selling things, uh, it's great to brand your work as well. So recently I've been playing around with lasers. They're super fun. Uh, here, the small little laser is really great for engraving or branding, laser engraving the edge. Um, full disclosure, yes, this is uh, an affiliate product. You know, I've been sent these lasers and I do have affiliate links down below, but I've made a lot of videos recently on just how fun lasers are as a hobbyist. And you know, this video is not sponsored by anyone, so might as well give a little shout out to lasers Super fun and great applications for branding your work. Uh, there's multiple different lasers. This one is kind of a, a more affordable option uh, than some of the big lasers, lots of uh, other possibilities. So if you're curious about lasers, you can check out that link. I got a bunch of different videos on the different kinds of lasers, but you can see some great results and, and the branding, uh, a branding iron, sometimes they can be cumbersome, uh, take forever, but really clean results and you get quick and efficient brands. So here's a video you can check out later that just kind of talks about the lasers and the options if you're interested. Okay, edge profiles. So I love a good chamfer, it's a good modern look. So that's just that 45 degree angle. You can do a chamfer, you can do a round over. So two different main profiles that work really well. And so that's what I'm doing here. I like to do it at the router table, but you can also use a handheld trim router, lots of options. But when you add a round over a chamfer, it really does add a lot to the board. At this point, now I'm sanding 120 grit. So I do 80 grit, then I do my profiles, and now I'm doing 120 grit. Okay, I am talking about another product that I have an affiliate link, I'm fully aware of that, but I only share things uh, from companies if they're legit amazing. And this surf prep sanding system is amazing, specifically the abrasives. So they have this foam that allows you to just not mess up with that profile at all. So I did zero hand sanding on this entire project. All of it was just using their abrasives. Specifically, those roundovers were perfect. I also can clean juice grooves without any hand sanding. I don't have to use dowels. I don't have to use anything else like that. I got into all the grooves on the sides just using their foam. Now this is their three by four inch sander, but they also have five inch discs uh, just to use for your own sander. So definitely look that, uh, look, check that out. It saved me a ton of work, a lot of headaches. No, but seriously, it saves so much hand fatigue, cramping, and you just get so much better results. Truly, this is the best batch of boards I've ever made uh, when I was using uh, those abrasives with the foam. So uh, check out the links down below. I don't care if you use my link or if I get a kickback at all, but truly it is the best tip I have found in the last you know, three to four years in woodworking. So it is a game changer for sanding uh, with all kinds of projects. And it's great for juice grooves and those handles. So check it out. Check it out. So one of the biggest steps that sometimes gets overlooked with cutting boards is raising the grain. This step is just really important. This is just water in a rag. You can use a spray bottle, but you wanna get all of the surface wet. You wanna raise all of those wood fibers up so then you can knock it down with sanding. At this point, I've sanded 80, 120 grit, and then 150 grit, and now I'm raising the grain. And what happens if I don't do this when someone washes their cutting board or gets it wet, it's all fuzzy and it won't be smooth anymore. So I'm intentionally raising the grain now and then I can lightly come back and sand everything at 220 grit, uh, a finer grit after it's dried out and the board is gonna stay smooth uh, you know, for then on into the future. So this is a really important step wet the boards, get them wet, and then just be careful that you just don't get them too wet. Uh, so then they you know, take in moisture and then they warp. And here is that 220 grit sanding. You wanna go really light. You don't need to sand too heavy here. Just take it nice and easy. Uh, you don't wanna over sand it because then you'll have to raise the grain again. Here you can see again, it really takes care of those juice grooves well. I do like to use the air compressor and just blow off that sanding dust a little bit, uh, especially in the juice grooves where sometimes that the abrasive uh, stuff can get stuck in the track and you just don't wanna scratch up your board at this point. All right, time for wood finish to unlock the beauty of the natural wood and protect it. So with wood finish, you have to make sure it is food safe, right? A food grade uh, material, it's gonna come in contact with food and you have some things to consider. Now I've used quite a few other products that aren't here. There's butcher block conditioners, board conditioners, 
Howard's, Bumble Shoots, Clark's, Atomic Finishes, lots of other ones out there that aren't pictured here that I've used. Uh, the most common one uh, that woodworkers do is just mineral oil. So get a food grade mineral oil and you just apply it and keep applying it or you dunk it. That's a great method. And then you always want to follow up with a wax. Uh, so I've made my own, I actually make my own little tins that I send with every board that's a mixture of mineral oil and beeswax. Great results. It is good, however, there are even better finishes uh, that I've used since. Uh, cutting board oil, so this brand, it's not actually made from walrus oil, it's the brand walrus oil. I, I have not encountered any products better. Um, I've never received this for free, I've always bought this with my own money, fantastic stuff. So this has mineral oil, coconut oil, waxes, all kinds of goodness in here. And so this just gets deeper penetration, more wax already in there. And then I follow up with their wood wax. And their wood wax, I've bought dozens of these tins. I now get the bigger one. It's, an, it's incredible. There is nothing, their recipe is just amazing. And so I'm gonna stop chasing their recipe. Great recipe, just buy it, it's good. Another finish that I have done on a batch of boards is tongue oil. So make sure it's pure tongue oil. Gotta be really careful with that. So walrus oil makes their own. And then you just mix it with a solvent, a citrus solvent, like kind of half and half for deep penetration. I'll leave a link down below to the Wood Whisperer, Mark Spagnolo's video on food safe finishes. He talks a lot about the advantages of this. It's a longer lasting finish, less maintenance for the board. It just takes a lot of time to apply. One thing I'll also note on this, when you apply it, don't dunk it. Don't dunk it like you do with mineral oil or cutting board oil. Uh, you get some issues with that. I've done that, learned the hard way. So if you're considering the tongue oil, check that out. Another one is tried and true. This is not as intense uh, as this, doesn't take as much. Uh, it's a, a linseed oil, but it's food grade, it's super safe. It lasts a little bit longer. I did this with my router tray video. So you can find my router tray video and see how I applied this. But um, all of these products, links down below if you're interested. But uh, the one I'm gonna do here, cutting board oil and then uh, walrus oil's wood wax. Great finish, see the results. Here we go. So the easiest way I found is just using a tub like this and then I just added some of that cutting board oil in here and then I can just apply it where I want. Uh, anything, you know, just goes into the, the bucket down below. I have used this before to just dunk boards in mineral oil. Uh, however, I do prefer the cutting board oil. It just has a couple more, you know, things to it. It's got that wax and other things, just a little bit more protection. But mineral oil, dunking in here is perfectly acceptable. You just don't need to soak it forever. Uh, it's not going to absorb super deep into it. Again, you can check out that Wood Whisper video uh, for more on these these finishes. Some really good tips there. Some good science. All right, so I've let the boards sit for overnight, you know, and the boards have kind of dried out a little bit for the most part. Uh, that oil and wax is is still there though so i need to dry it off so i'm removing uh, any of the excess that wasn't absorbed there's a couple spots especially on the end grain that just needs a little bit more i'm just kind of buffing it in now this is an unnecessary step but i like my boards super smooth so i go ahead and i'm sanding them all at 320 grit i'm going really careful here just very lightly i'm using the foam on this, that, that sander again. So you could just use, you know, a scouring pad or excuse me, a non-abrasive pad or steel wool if you wanted to. This is just to make it super smooth. Not necessary, but I just think it's a nice step. Uh, the paper does get a little oily because you've just oiled the boards, but the boards get a lot smoother. All right, now I'm adding that wax. This is that walrus oil board wax or whatever wax you use. I really recommend the, the walrus oil. It is such, it's, it's amazing stuff. And so I'm applying it everywhere. I did use a heat gun just to help penetrate it a little bit more. And on this, I just let it sit overnight. And then I come back the next day and I buff it all in. So I'm using shop towels to remove excess, kind of hand buffing in most of it. Then I'm just using an orbital buffer to kind of help the process, hand fatigue. They're pretty inexpensive and it works well. But you just want to buff in all that wax, get it nice, nice and shiny. And you got protection and you got luster and you cut gorgeous boards like so. So again, these were primarily those edge grain boards like this, and there's just that natural beauty, right? So uh, make a great selection on woods, and you can get some great results. So check out that Wood 101 video for, for more ideas on wood, but uh, some fun boards. And there you have it, cutting board 101 and 102. Hopefully this video provided value for you. Uh, if it did, please consider subscribing to see more videos like this. 
This is typically what we do, hardwoods, beautiful projects like this. Like I mentioned, yes, we have started playing around with lasers, some cool things. So there are some gadgets and gizmos that you might see. However, cutting boards, hardwoods, that's really my jam. That's what I love to make. So anyway, uh, if you're interested in any of the tools, any of the products I use, there are links down below. they are affiliate links, yes. That means I get a percentage of the sale. So hey, you can support the channel so I can make more videos like this, or you can just use your own link. You don't have to use it, that's fine too. Uh, anyway, if you're interested in buying cutting boards, website's down below. Uh, but I got a lot of other stuff over on Instagram, uh, some more tips and tricks all that good stuff. So thank you for watching. Until next time, have fun making some sawdust.